the sign shows up. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, we've already been looking at many of the prophecies that from the Old Testament that dealt with Jesus's ministry, uh, that Jesus was to come. And now we're dealing with those that deal with Jesus's uh, death and resurrection. Um, the one that we're going to hit today in the handout was, is our number five. And I really love how even in Job's time, think about it, Job predated Abraham, maybe by as much as two generations. Um, and uh, there was no Bible, there's no law, there's no written, you know, uh, scripture in Job's time. But yet, we see Job is a man of faith. And we'll see Job, what Job says. I mean, it's amazing how Job can bring out some of those items that deal with, he knew that our salvation was yet to come. Okay, I'm talking about, when I say our, I'm talking about mankind in general, from Job's time all the way through, okay? Mm -hmm. and because one of the things that he says is, I know that my Redeemer lives. Yep. I, I mean, what a strong statement to be coming from even before Moses' time when he wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. It was, you know, before his time that there was an inherent knowledge within people at some level. And Job lived it, though. Not only did he have the knowledge, but he lived it out. And we see how God did some wonderful work in Job and proved himself through Job. So we'll be looking at, uh, and we'll pick up in Job and some of the prophecies from there, and then we'll continue on from there. But I think we'll see some wonderful stuff. And I like kind of what Aaron said uh, when he came in. He is saying, hey, you know, once we finish these, this set of prophecies about Jesus, maybe we can look at some of the prophecies that haven't yet been fulfilled. Uh, wow. And I think that that would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, to where we can say, hey, these are still pending. They are to come. And since God has already shown that in our study, he's already carried out the prophecies, you know, that were already talked about in the Old Testament, and we see them already carried out in the New Testament, we see that it happens. We know that even these that haven't been fulfilled yet will be fulfilled. Uh, I mean, it's just a given that it's to come. So, yeah, we'll look at that. Awesome. Hi, Donna. Hi, hey, Donna. Hi, Gail. Hi, Doug. How y'all doing? Hi. Hi, who is that? Was that Sherry Margaret? and Aaron? Me, Sherry. Yeah. Hi, Sherry. And Hi, Aaron. Margaret. Hi, Aaron. And Victor. Hi, Victor. And Margaret. <laughs> I said Margaret. Margaret first. Oh, oh Margaret. sorry, sorry. Shame on me. Pay attention. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what we'll look at and uh then we'll we'll pick up there at the number five one in the handout so let's go ahead and pray and and then we'll get going dear heavenly father we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together to study your word and to get to know you better lord because we want to become more like you lord jesus and we know that in scripture in your word you bring out such wonderful truths that we can depend on and build our lives on and walk in your way in a way that is righteous because you're the one that has shown that, hey, you're, all, you're in control, Lord, and you've already got it all planned out and you know exactly what's going to happen. So we thank you for your word, Lord, and thank you that you give us opportunity to get to know you better through your word. So open our hearts and minds, I pray, and dear Holy Spirit, just give us insight as we study your word on these prophecies, that you may get the honor and the glory, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, well, speaking of the handout, let me go ahead and bring up the handout, and we'll take a look at it. Uh, yeah, I brought it up for myself, but I didn't bring it up to share, so I was like, uh-oh, I guess I better share it out. Okay, here we go. Um, now we're going to be looking, like I said, in Job, and we're going to look here about 
Christ's resurrection prophesied even all the way back in probably what was the first book to be written in the canon of scripture that we have today. And so uh, now we're going to be looking at Job 19. It's not at the end of all of his trials when he's talking to God at the end, you know, like in the 30 chapters 30 uh, in that area. But this is in chapter 19. So it's still while he is exchanging uh, different conversations and rhetoric with his quote unquote friends, right? The ones that came to help him. And then, of course, you know, they're having this discussion from then on back and forth. Different ones are discussing. So but in this case, this is Job who's talking. He's he's providing insight to his three friends and he's addressing some things. And so let's take a look at what he's telling them. He says, oh, that my words were recorded and that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. In other words, to be permanent. I know that my redeemer lives. And there you go, right there. I know that my redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand on earth. Now, I'll tell you what, that is an awesome, you know, thing to be said by Job that he knows that our redeemer, his redeemer would actually come and stand on earth. And we know that Jesus came to earth and we know he will come back again. So first advent, second advent, right? First coming, second coming. So he's- Excuse always, me, Ted. Yeah, Ted, go ahead, Aaron. How did he have his information to it, have such faith? Yeah, what, it's called oral name? tradition. The way that everything was passed down back then, it would have all been passed down word of mouth, okay? So- in Noah's day, remember after the flood, Noah was, was the one who had all this information and he passed it down to his sons, okay? And so they would have then passed it down to their sons. It was all done orally, it wasn't in writing. But I think God also was involved with them when they passed that information down. And I think God actually talked to people back then more directly. I mean, because we see it with Cain and Abel, God talked to them. We see that Enoch talked to God all the time. We see that, you know, Noah talked to God. And so we see that this is coming down. And for those people that really had a heartfelt desire to know him, they were the ones that were like, they captured this information. And I think Job was one of those guys. He was a righteous man. If you go back into Job chapter one. Uh, it says that he was a righteous man. In other words, I think he was open to receiving this information and he knew God more intimately than any of the others. And so I think that's how God revealed him. And that's why God could tell Satan at the beginning, hey, have you seen my servant Job? You know, he is an upright and righteous man. Yeah, I mean, hey, don't you wish, you know, God would be saying that about you and me? <laughs> That'd be nice. Did how how many generations approximately did Job come after Noah? I think I I I don't know about after Noah, but I put him at least one to two generations before Abraham. So if that's the I case, that, I think that um, I read somewhere that the wait a minute. Um, the woman that Moses married after he fled in out of Egypt. Okay. Um, that her father was a descendant of Job, if I remember correctly. There's something. He was a I Midianite. Can... Yeah, he was one of the and Midianites. That was, that was one of Job's. Um, oh, it wouldn't surprise um, me, but that was after. Um, yeah, that would have been after Job. Um, well, yeah, I mean, but Job was, I think Job was around about the same time as Abraham, maybe like you said a little bit before, but if I remember correctly, that the that the woman that um, Moses married was a descendant of Job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess one of his kids was called Midian, Midian or something like that. I remember studying that. 
But the one thing that bothers me about this verse is that God says, oh, by the way, and he points him out and goes, have you noticed my servant Job? It's like, um, <laughs> I've been just happy to be uh, not. <laughs> yeah, I was like, God, do you have to make me so prominent? Just I I'm fine down here just as I am. <laughs> I'm just going to keep my head down and keep following yeah. and I don't need to have yeah. any attention drawn to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but if if I had to hazard a guess, I'd say six to seven generations after Noah. That's amazing because yeah. I don't hard, I barely remember anything my grandmother told me when I was you know yeah yeah plenty old enough to remember anything she would tell me. I think people had a much better memory back then. And see, another thing is too, they don't depend. They back then they didn't depend on anything written or anything like that even though notice what he's saying here that they were written on a scroll and that they were inscribed in iron tool on that so they he knew about those things he knew about writing things down but in this case we have no archaeological record that back in that time there was a lot of writing there were some stellas they called them s-t-e-l-e's that have been discovered that where they actually did just that, where they inscribed things on rocks that go date all the way back to the early Babylonian time frame. But uh, we see nothing like that of God's writings or anything from God. It was more, you know, like the kings would write some of their history or something like that. But I mean, what we see though is that, yeah, I mean, Everything that I've studied says that it was all oral tradition and people uh, amazingly could memorize big blocks of information and pass it down. Uh, well, their they, they had to have, cause that's just yeah. an amazing thing after that many generations. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's just mind boggling to me. And yeah, but I guess if you, when you, you, you hear it, then you, then when you hear it enough, probably obviously more than one time, it kind of will start to sink in. And then you have to tell the next, you tell the next generation, I guess there might be a lot of repetition. Right. So maybe that's part of the reason yeah. it gets yeah. through down well, that, the line of generations. And that's what, and that's what, or if you remember, that's what Moses told them, the Israelites to do in Deuteronomy chapter six. Remember he told them to tell your children in the morning when they get up, when you go along the way, when you sit down to eat, when you get up to play, when you take them to bed, every single time, remind them of all the wonders that God has done. Uh -huh. I mean, to me, that's that's a full day right there of just nothing but telling them about God. You know what I'm saying? And it's like that. That's how God told them to do it every day. So that they would have I missed that one. Yeah, it, yeah, it's in Deuteronomy chapter six, uh, which is, you know, known as the Shema. Yeah, he, he tells, but that's not the only place he tells them that, but that's where the Shema is at, and, which was kind of like a, a guidance and a direction for the people to carry out that that's how they were to teach their children day and night, basically, you know. <laughs> I have a little tidbit that people may be interested in knowing. Yeah. Maybe not, but on, <laughs> New, on Newsmax, they did a special on Charlton Heston. Mm -hmm. You know, he made, he's in the movie, The Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody likes it. That's one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they, uh, you know, he, tra uh, Charlton Heston, he traveled with his family when he made his movies. He liked to be with his family. Oh. And it turns out, that um, when they were shooting the Ten Commandments, the baby that they they put in the, to sell down the na the Nile in that little basket mm -hmm. was his real son. Oh, wow! Like, and he, it almost hit, it, uh, the baby almost drowned. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> they didn't put enough pitch it. in it. <laughs> I don't know, but that's what they were saying on this documentary on Newsmax. Uh huh. Oh. Uh -huh. So. I thought that was an interesting tip yeah. because I had watched it so many years. I had never known that that was his own kid. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. But yeah, you're right. I mean, these are, I mean, it's amazing the things that you learn as you study the Bible. You know, it's kind of like Donna says, when you really start getting into it, you learn a lot of things like that, you know, Zipporah, which was uh, Moses's wife, the daughter of a priest, a Midianite priest, which is who he had worked for for 40 years as a shepherd. Yeah, amazing 
the things that come out of that, you know, and what you learn in the process. And yeah, I didn't know that, by the way, Don, I hadn't heard that, uh, that he was a descendant of Job. But uh, I mean, these are interesting things that you find out as you, as you study God's word and you start realizing, wow, this is amazing. So, so we see he keeps. Actually, Ted, that would make sense because it seemed like uh, Moses's wife's father was a believer. At least. Yeah, well, remember and, that he went uh, He went with Moses. Moses said, hey, why don't you come with us? And he said, no, I'm not going to go with you. But he said, hey, you know, and I mean, the guy was wise. As a matter of fact, he's the one that told him that he needed to, you know, stop trying to do everything himself and to get others in the, the community to come together and be leaders over people, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of ten. And basically break down because he says, otherwise, you're going to burn out, buddy. And and that's exactly what he did. And God then spread his Holy Spirit over these others so that then they could all lead the people. And, and I mean, he was a wise individual and gave great counsel to Moses. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, wow. So, yeah. Okay. So we see. That Job, man, he's he's on it. He knows about it. He knows that his Redeemer lives. And I mean, this is prophetic, though. This isn't something, you know, even though it got passed down, this is prophetic that it was to happen. OK, and so we see that he's aware that there's been a problem, sin, and that there has to be a solution. And the solution is right there in that one sentence. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. I mean, that is beautiful. And he says, and after my skin has been destroyed, in other words, once he's dead, yet in my flesh, I will see God. So he knows he has a relationship with God and that, you know, when you die, you get to go be with the Lord if you were his, right? Mm -hmm. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. See, this is one of those things in that argument where people say, oh, well, when you die, you don't really remember or you don't really see or your spirit. And No, this actually says uh, you're going to have your senses and your memory when you die and you get to go be with the Lord, you see God, you're going to know it's him. You're going to know him. He's going to know you. Even though back in this time, guess what? When he died, he went to paradise. But I mean, yeah, it, you see the, you see the um, parable of that in the Lazarus and the rich man, that's that, right. um, that rich man knew everything that was going on and he was not in heaven. That's it. And so he remembered Abraham uh, Lazarus he remembered everything so yep. that's an old testament picture of a new testament principle right I'll tell there you, it's 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 amazing what job had an appreciation for way back you know i mean i it just kind of blows my mind that this is actually you know happening that he's able to say these things and he well, and basically say, what's that i was going to say you know you guys were talking about the oral tradition mm -hmm. and from what I gather, um, the way the, the the Bible is written, it's almost like it, it was a poetry, but not like poetry that rhymes like what we have today. Right. But there was a uh, cadence to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by telling the stories, they were in a song mm -hmm. with lyrics that, that would make the people remember them because they were singing them. That's right. And yeah. that's a different way of memorizing. You know, like, you know, when you teach little kids, you know, you watch Sesame Street or any of these things and you see how they sing songs in it. You know, and I remember back even in the 70s when I first got uh, born again, there was a lot of scripture songs that were out, you know, that people sang and stuff. And I read the Bible and those songs come to my, I read through them and go, oh, that's where that song came from. And oh, that's where that song came from. So I think that the reason that they were able to remember it so well Mm -hmm. is because they made it like a like a cadence you know yeah, some kind yeah. of a poetry and you were saying that in um about putting the the them on the doorposts and stuff like that and putting them on your forehead that's where that little phylactery thing that yep. the Jewish people came from they put it in they put scriptures in those little boxes and put them on their forehead so 
it was kind of a yep. uh, way of them doing that. So they, they wrote them down everywhere so that people could see them and remember them. Right. So I think it, it was part, it was just so much part of, of seeing it every day and singing it. And, you know, uh, I just think that, I think that's how they ended up remembering it so well. Plus yeah. it was written down. It just was only written down like in one place or two places, but it was written down. Mm-hmm. And I believe that Noah brought it on the ark with him when he wrote down what Adam and all of them had said. That's yeah, just. I yeah, anyway. I don't know. I mean, I don't have anything or at least the archaeology class I had um, in mm-hmm. seminary, they they didn't say they had anything that gave them empirical data that there was anything written like in the time of the ark. Okay. They, they, well, just, they just went mainly by oral tradition. Yeah. But I think the oral tradition was more in a lyrical way. Oh, it so it, it wouldn't surprise me. That. Yeah, because I mean, that's how the people remembered the Psalms and whatnot. Most right. of those were sung. Yeah. Uh-huh. Even even in the Psalms, it says it says written in the in, along the lines of, um, you know, when you read certain Psalms, uh-huh. it says written uh-huh. to the tune of something or another or something. That's or right. Another. So yeah, exactly. it was all, um, I, that's how I think they remembered it was through through songs. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. I agree. I agree. So notice notice here. I think I think there's a couple things here that fit within something like what Paul said when he says, after my skin has been destroyed, I will see God. That fits with what Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You know, it fits in that scripture. And then he says, I myself will see him with my own eyes and I and yet not another. How my heart yearns within me. Remember what Paul said? I'd rather be with Christ. You know, go be with him right now. But the only reason I'm hanging around is because God has a plan for me to do something with y'all right now. (laughs) And it it kind of fits, you know, you say, wow, that's amazing that there is such symmetry and parallelism in that respect in terms of the way Job said some things and how Paul said (laughs) some things too in his writings. Yeah, so that's it. That's Job 19, 23 through 27. So let's take a look now and look at the fulfillment of it. And, and the fulfillment that's brought out is John chapter 5, 24 through 29. And he says, very truly, I tell you, whoever, this is Jesus talking now, by the way, okay? Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And I will not be judged. I'm sorry and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Now, this is Jesus. He's here on earth, and he is proclaiming this information. And he says, very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Okay, so, and that's Jesus, he's proclaiming this, and he's here on earth right then, telling them he is the Son of God, right? For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. And he says, do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. And that's at the very end, okay, when the people are coming out of the grave in that respect. Uh, But what we see is that Jesus is already here on earth, just as Job had indicated that his feet, remember, he would stand on earth. Well, that's exactly what was happening. Jesus is proclaiming this, and then Jesus is also prophesying to the future, right? So that's kind of one of those prophecies that Aaron was talking about. He says, well, when what, when will this happen? You know, when will the people in the graves that hear his voice come out, and those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil to be condemned? When will that happen? And we know that's yet to come. That's coming at the second advent when Jesus comes back the second time. That that's when the graves will be open. And then that's 
at the end of all of that, that's when the great judgment happens, right? And those, that's the great white throne. And all of those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will go before the great white throne. So we see that is yet to come. But I think the beauty of it is just that Jesus is here on earth, just as he proclaimed, and that Jesus, in being here on earth, becomes the redeemer for all mankind, for all sin, for all time. I mean, wow, you talk about an ideal from way back and it being fulfilled several thousand years later, you know, I mean, maybe almost as much as 2,500 years after, you know, Job had indicated Job lived. So pretty amazing stuff, huh? Yep. Okay, so any question on, on that prophecy and that Jesus fulfilled it just being here on earth and, and also then state and prophecy in the process. One quick one. It yeah, says, sure. with my own eyes, I yeah. and not another. What is uh, not another? He's not going to get another set of eyes. What, is, what does that mean? Well, what he's saying is that it is he himself that is going to be the witness to this when he dies. That, in other words, if somebody says, oh, well, it's not really you. It's it's you know, it's kind of like your ghost or it's uh, some kind of, um, what was the word that they used? Um, uh, I'll just use ghost. In other words, he's saying, because back then they would have believed in ghosts and spirits and stuff like that. And so he's saying, it's not really a spirit or anything, but it's me. It's really me, my own eyes. I will see him after I die. And notice he's saying that it's his flesh is being destroyed. So he's talking about that when he leaves the flesh, that he is going to be totally conscious, totally able to use his senses. And he himself knows that it's he himself and that it, when he sees God, he's seeing him with his own eyes. And it's not some figment of imagination or something like that, like a ghost kind of thing, but that it is really he himself. Thank Does you. that answer it, Aaron? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Are you looking for the word aberration? Is that what you're thinking of? No, I was thinking of one of those, you know, like a movie. There was a movie and it had, it, it's kind of like a dark movie. It really isn't Christian at all. Um, <laughs> poltergeist, poltergeist. That's what I was trying to think of because poltergeists are what they kind of thought people might become after they died. And that's why Job is saying, no, it's not another, it's me, not some poltergeist, not some ghost, it's me, Ani. And so that's why he's bringing that out that way. Okay, so let's move on. Um, now, we know that Jesus was forsaken. See, I mean, doing these prophecies about Jesus, we already know they were fulfilled. But, I mean, it's great to see that they were prophesied. So... We're going to see the Messiah would be forsaken. And now let's just take a look at something very simple. Psalm 22, verse 1. As a matter of fact, Jesus used this psalm while he was on the cross, right? He actually articulated it. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish, right? Well, we know that this part here, he said, right? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so, but he didn't articulate this, or at least we don't have any indication that he articulated the rest of that verse one. But still, categorically, it is all a prophecy, right? And we see it was fulfilled in Jesus when he was on the cross, right? And in Matthew 27, verse 46, he says, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, El E, El E, Lama Sabachthani. Okay, in other words, my God, El E is my God, Lama, it's actually L A M A, well, at least in Hebrew today, it's Lama. Sab Lama is why, Sabachthani, Ani is me, Sabach is forsake. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's what Jesus cried on the cross. He was actually stating that first entry point to Psalm 22. And it was fulfilled when Jesus 
gave up his life and breathed his laugh, he said this just before he breathed his laugh, because, you know, but he had to do that because it was the only way that his sacrificial death would be accepted as a payment by the father as the remission for all sins, past, present, and future. Now that is great, you know, because I mean, hey, we're, we're taking advantage of this today, aren't we? Because, hey, we need to have our sins forgiven all the time. And Jesus died for all those sins already and paid the price uh, to the satisfaction of the father. And I think that's beautiful that that was carried out when Jesus died on the cross. If, if um, that was part of the plan from the beginning that he would die for the sins, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's what he came for. And I don't understand why he said, why have you forsaken me when he knew that was part of the plan that he was supposed to die? That's I the think, part I don't understand. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think he did it because people were there and they needed to hear what Jesus had to say. I mean, he could have just been quiet the whole time on the cross and never said a thing, right? But I think everything that he said on the cross was said for a purpose, and it got documented, and it shows that he was fulfilling scripture by articulating it. Had he kept quiet, you know, there wouldn't have been a tie-in back to that. But in this case, since he articulated it, there is a tie-in, and I think that was part of God's plan that there would be tie-in between old, you know, the old, and then, because he knew he was coming to establish the new covenant. And I think that was part of establishing the new covenant is showing that he was aware that he was fulfilling the old covenant. So that's why he articulated things. That, yeah, today we would say, I would have just kept my mouth shut. I didn't have anything to say, right? But in that case, I think we would have, he would have said it just for that purpose, yeah. Okay, so now we see that Jesus is crucified. He dies, right? And that also, when Jesus was on the cross, I mean, there are different places in the Old Testament that talks about that Jesus would actually have to go through. Isaiah talks about it. Look at Isaiah 53. I mean, it goes through it. But in this case, let's look at this one in Matthew, or Matthew Psalm 22, but verse 8 now, okay? And he says, now, these are the guys that are standing under the cross. These are the Pharisees. These are the, what they called the leaders of the Jews. So it could have been Pharisees. It could have been Sadducee. It could have been Herodians. It could have been those that were part of the leadership of the Jews. But anyway, what they said is they look at what they were looking up at the cross and they're kind of sneering at Jesus, you know, like, aha, he trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. You know, basically just being very uh, sarcastic and very condescending and, you know, just basically telling God, hey, if you really are God, then what are you doing up on that cross? You can get yourself down. So, you know, you're nobody. You're just, you know, a charlatan. That's fundamentally what they're saying in this psalm. And they're repeating something, I mean, the psalm actually stipulates what they ended up saying. Look at, then we look at Matthew 27, verses 42 and 43. Look what it says. They basically just repeating that psalm. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and he, we will believe in him. Yeah, right. They didn't believe in him the whole time that Jesus was there. They weren't going to believe in him, even if he did come down off the cross. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. So in other words, they're mocking him, right? They're just basically, they're demeaning him. They're holding him in contempt. And they're just making fun of him. That's what they're doing. Well, and that's exactly what Psalm 22 was talking about. Is that this was what they were going to say. And sure enough, that is exactly what they said. They ended up coming demeaning, you know, mocking him. and. And Jesus kept quiet. So any questions on that one? Okay. Now, yeah, I, uh, when we look, uh, notice this is all coming from Psalm 22, by the way. Okay, these five, six, and seven, now we're at eight. And he says, uh, from Psalm 22, verse 15, he says, um, 
my mouth dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Well, hey, when you are crucified, for anybody that was crucified, I, I don't say you, that's just a figurative you, but um, those people that were crucified, I mean, it was probably the worst uh, torture that was available. I think I mentioned that last week. I mean, it was terrible. Well, I mean, your body is just struggling to get breath and you're having to push up off of your feet and your legs to try to push up enough so that your arms aren't drawn out and keeping you from taking in a deep breath or a breath. So they push up enough just to loosen the weight off their arms and take a breath. Yeah, what's that, Victor? I'm relating to what you're saying. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so they take in a breath and then they're just tired. So they let themselves back down and they're hanging by their arms again, which collapses their lungs. You know, I mean, it is it is a terrible, terrible thing. And I mean, your mouth dries out you're, because you're... <sighs> you're doing kind of like a dog panting, you know, because you can't take a normal breath. So you do kind of, <laughs> and it dries out your mouth and, and your tongue sticks to your mouth. And he says, you lay me in the dust of death. So in essence, you know, it's, it's the end, the dust of death. It's the end for Jesus. Right. And that's exactly what happened while he was up on that cross. I mean, he was having to endure all that, that torture. And so in John chapter 19, look what he says. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And that's exactly why, because his mouth was dried up like a potsherd and his tongue was sticking to the roof of his mouth. He needed something to drink or to, to at least quench his thirst. And remember they said that they put uh, a sponge on a stick and they dipped it in some uh like vinegar vinegar yeah and they gave it to him and did he drink no. it, he it was it was bad okay but supposedly uh if he had been able to drink that it would have had kind of like an anesthetic effect you know it would have helped a little not much but in this case he fulfilled, he's, uh, John makes it clear that the only reason he said I'm thirsty is because Jesus knew it was part of prophecy that needed being fulfilled. And so what Jesus did on the cross was specifically to finish carrying out God's plan based on what he had already said would happen, it, you know, uh, a thousand years before in this case. Getting back to that uh, part where they're gasping for breath, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that the reason they broke their legs so they couldn't stand themselves up? That's right. Well, yeah. in this case, normally what they would do is they wouldn't break their legs. Uh, I mean, if it was just the Romans, the Jews had nothing to do with it. They would let them stay there until they die. OK, I mean, just torture. But because it was the Jews, the Jews weren't supposed to be aren't weren't allowed to be on a tree because of the law the law said you know you had to have them in by a certain time if it was the sabbath day and that kind of thing that's why they oh, okay. broke the legs of those two that were there because this was jewish area it was under <laughs> jewish rule not not that they were in control the romans were in control but it was their jewish sovereignty basically and not sovereignty but they didn't want him hanging on the cross. That's during right. Passover. It, that's right. It was, it was like, we don't want to look at that while we're doing Passover. Yeah. I, yeah. Bunch of hypocrites. But, uh, <laughs> but hypocritical. yeah, exactly. But so that's why they ended up breaking the legs of the other two, because they wanted to fulfill what the Jews wanted, which is get them down off that cross. And they the only way they the Romans were going to get them off the cross is if they were dead. And so that's why they broke the legs of the other two. So yeah, exactly what you're saying, Victor, so that they would die quicker because now they can't push up. Right. And in very short order, they're going to suffocate. They won't be able to get any air in their lungs and they'll die. Yeah. But Jesus was already dead when they were coming around. And that's why they stuck the spear in his side. And it oh. fulfilled that other prophecy we looked up earlier that none of his bones were broken. 
So yeah. th that prophecy was fulfilled. Who was it that requested that they do not break his legs? Right, right. He didn't request it at all. It was just that he was already dead. Yeah. Somebody, somebody else requested the Romans not to break his legs. Who was that? I read in there somewhere that when they went to break his legs, somebody in the in the crowd, uh, John or whoever the the the, gra the guy who gave him the grave to be buried in said no don't break his legs i don't know victor you got me does anybody know i thought i read that no i just knew that they that they were going to break their legs to make sure they died before the sundown for passover and when they came along um they saw that jesus was dead and then they he drew the spear and just to check to make sure that's why he threw the spear right, in right. to make sure if if that blood and water ran out, then that meant he was dead. Something something to do with that. I'm not really sure what the whole deal was, but that's why he ran the spear through there. That and then they didn't break his legs. Well, um, the thing was, yeah, by running the spear in, if he wasn't dead, he definitely was going to be dead after that spear was rammed in all the way to his heart. <laughs> right, exactly. So yeah. they wouldn't have had to break his legs. But in the Old Testament. It says um, on the Passover lamb that you weren't supposed to break any of the bones and all of that. And that had to do with um, right. the Messiah that we weren't supposed to break any of his legs. And I believe that the reason that um, when they came along and found like they were going to kill all three of them, that he was already dead because nobody took Jesus's life. He laid it down freely. Yep. And so he decided when he was going to live, be born, he decided when he was going to be dead. And no, no man on earth had any say so about about that's right. when he was yeah. going to go. That that's was right. that's that was all God's plan. plan. Yeah, exactly. Not man's. Exactly. So nobody took his life. I mean, people say, "Oh, the Romans crucified him. Oh, the Jews crucified him." Well, they might have, but he really chose when chose how he was going to die, when he was going to die. That was Amen. all part of God's what he plan. decided before the foundations of the earth. So that Absolutely. was that's just my feeling anyway. Yeah, yeah Gail, what do you have, young lady? Um, I was just going to say, I remember reading it somewhere also about not breaking the bones. Yeah, well, if you go back to, I, I don't remember, is that in Isaiah 53? Is that part of that? I know that Isaiah 51 through like 56 has allusions, but 50 allusions to, you know, what Jesus is going to carry out in prophecy. But 53 is probably the most poignant one um, about uh -huh. Jesus. But I, I, I imagine, okay. I imagine so, some of the stuff we will read will eventually get to Isaiah. Right now, we're still in Psalms, Psalms, Luke, Mark, Psalm thirty-eight, Psalm. Oh, it looks like they're just staying in the Psalms for these prophecies. Hang on, let's try to say Ephesians, Psalms, Psalms. Oh, yeah, I'm surprised. Well, oh, there we go. They, they start hitting Isaiah down here around uh, number 20, Isaiah 25, and then Isaiah 50. Oh, they didn't. Yeah, Isaiah 50. Oh, okay. So they didn't, they're, they're not even getting into Isaiah 53 in this one. But, but yeah, so. But I'll tell you, yeah, th that's probably where you're thinking of, Gail, I'm thinking. But, you yeah. know, Ezekiel even hits on some points, you know, and they don't have any Ezekiel in here. That's why I'm saying they're, we're just hitting on certain specific ones. But, I mean, there's a lot more that were actually fulfilled. There were hundreds that were fulfilled in Jesus' coming uh, ministry and death. There were hundreds. So... That's I, that's the beauty of it is that, you know, and all of them were fulfilled, not yeah. just one or two, but all of them. Uh -huh. And that's what gives it, you know, credibility and solidity is that only God could have done that kind of predicting, prophesying, if you will. Yeah. Right. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, OK, well, let's look at the psalm that talks about piercing of Christ's hands and feet. OK. Uh, in Psalm 22, he goes, dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. 
They pierce my hands and my feet. Now, remember, this is outside of the city of Jerusalem, outside the walls of Jerusalem. Hey, believe me, there were dogs and there were other questionable folk out in that area because, hey, there were a lot of people that were crucified and died and that kind of thing out there. Kidron Valley is out there. And this is where, I mean, so there would have been animals, you know, that would have taken on uh, food, that kind of thing out there. So that's why dogs would have been there and villains, meaning, hey, you know, <laughs> less than reputable people were also there. Okay. And so we see, I mean, in a lot of t cases, the reason the villains are there, they're trying to see if they can get anything from those that are being crucified. You know, if they can maybe a part of their clothes or, you know, how they, uh, they threw lots for Jesus's clothing. Remember that? Well, the villains are out there trying to see if they can get something also from whoever is being crucified or something like that. So that's what they're talking about there in Psalm 22. And then in John 19, look what it says. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture say, they will look on the one they have pierced. So, so just like we were talking about earlier, you know, this isn't the only scripture that talks about no bones being broken. I mean, we, we already studied uh, one before uh, on that specific topic, but there are several. And I mean, I think if we were to get into Isaiah 53 or something like that, we'd see you know, as a matter of fact, why don't we just take a quick look at Isaiah 53 here. And let me see what I can say. Uh, 53. Um, let's, let's just take a quick look at that and just see what we're talking about here. Let me go over here. Um, and he says... Uh, I think I just skimmed through it and didn't say nothing. Okay. Uh, have an impressive form. or See, Jesus wasn't somebody that, you know, came as an impressive person. Not like we, we were talking about uh, Charlton Heston. You know, he, Jesus didn't come looking like a Charlton Heston. Okay. Um, Basically, they say, hey, he's, he's not, he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. In other words, he didn't come like that. He was despised and rejected by men. We know that he was a man of suffering, right? Who knew what sickness was. Uh, he was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. We know Jesus lived out all those things. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He was pierced. Here, here's the pierced. He was pierced because of our rebellion, right? He was pierced in his hands and feet. We were just talking about being pierced. Uh, our, and uh, crushed because of our iniquities, punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We're healed both spiritually and, and in some cases physically, right? Yeah. We as sheep go astray. Um, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And if you look through all the times that he stood before many of the kings and Pilate, in many cases, he he kept his mouth shut, right? Mm -hmm. When he went before Herod, uh, Herod or was it Herod that he didn't he didn't say anything the whole time because the guy wanted him to do a miracle and Jesus didn't do anything, right? Oh. Oh. So he kept silent. Um, he was taken away of oppression, judgment, uh, living, spoken because he had no violence. He had not spoken deceitfully. The Lord was pleased to crush him severely. That's what Donna was talking about. It was all God's plan and his voluntary actions. It was God's plan to crush him. Uh, that was the father's plan because that was the only acceptable redemption sacrifice that he would accept was Jesus dying and shedding his blood. Um, uh, let's see. He bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Okay, hold on. Let me, let me see here. We'll spread out the right widowhood, wounded in spirit, everlasting love, water. Do the mountains move and the hills shake my uh, If anyone attacks you, whoever attacks you, I have created to destroy because I have a form of form against you will prosper. Uh, come, everyone who stood to yourself, suffering from realism, okay. 
what was the scripture we were looking for, Doug? I don't know. Not to break Look. his legs. Oh, not to break his legs. Oh, okay. Um, Bones. It stated somewhere in there. Oh, what was that, Gail? It was not to break his bones. It was listed somewhere. I just can't remember where. Okay. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Let me see here. Let me go. Here. Keep seeing, keep scrolling through there. I keep seeing right, the word. Uh, Psalms 3420. Okay. 3420, Cherry. Yeah, try that one. Okay. Thank you. Psalms? Yes. 34, 20. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. There you go. That was in Psalm 34, you said? 34, 20. Okay, okay. Well, let's, let me take another quick look here and see. Uh, ch -ch -ch. It's also mentioned in John 19.36. Right, the that's a fulfillment, yeah. Right. Right. And then Exodus 12.46. Let's see. Sherry, hmm? did you say Matthew? I said John and Exodus. Yeah, Exodus John twelve forty six. Yeah, Exodus twelve forty six is where they talk about the Passover lamb not having any of his bones broken. Right. Exodus twelve forty six, and then in Numbers nine twelve they kind of uh, say it again. Nor break because Jesus is the Passover lamb. So I I guess that's about as close as we're going to get. Psalms. Um, 3020, Donna says. 3420. Um, 34, yeah, 34, 20. 20. I'm sorry. Right, right. So. Yeah, so anyway, but yeah, I, but remember that, you know, we, we have to tie it in to the Passover lamb which is what brings more to bear, right? Yeah, because Jesus was the Passover lamb. So anything that had to do with that, like an Exodus or Numbers would apply to Jesus as well, because they were the type of the sacrifice that Jesus was to carry out on the cross. So, okay, good. So, so I mean, we, we see how those things uh, come into play uh, as as we look at what Jesus actually carried out, I mean, he's fulfilling these prophecies as we go, and I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's coincident. I mean, some would say, well, it's just coincidental that Jesus just ended up dead. No, that was God's plan <laughs> that they didn't have to break his legs like they did for the other two thieves that were buried with or crucified with him. So, I mean, that's important that we see that that happened and that that occurred. Okay, so let's see here. Let's go back then to uh, okay. Not one. Okay, so then let's go to the next one. They said they would cast lots for Jesus's clothing, and we know that happened, right? Right. They said, and Psalm 22, again, we're still in Psalm 22, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And that one plays out in John 19 also, when it says, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them in the four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, which means it was a, a very good costly garment so they said let's not tear it they said to one another let's decide by lot who will get it and this happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled that said they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment and that's what they did 
So does that is what the soldiers did. They cast lots, almost like as if it was choreographed, right? Like, hey, it, it, it's got to happen this way. And it just got carried out. Now, I mean, you can't force somebody to do something. This is just something that ended up following exactly what the scripture said. These were Roman soldiers. They wouldn't have been reading the scriptures. They wouldn't have known anything about, you know, the Torah or, or the Tanakh or any of that. They would have been oblivious to any of that. But yet, look at how it got carried out. Just, just as perfect as you will in exactly the way that it had to happen, you know, with Jesus being on the cross. I mean, talk about specificity. I mean, it's, it's quite specific, right? Yeah, Donna, go ahead. That's what blows me away so much about when I try to share share with people about prophecy uh-huh. and stuff. And I go and I'll say, well, that was prophesied in the Bible. And they go, oh, no, that just happened because so and so did such and such and such and such and so and so. And I'm like, <laughs> well, God didn't say how or why he was going to make it happen. He just said it was going to make it happen. And these people were unwitting. Um, uh, tools that god used you know and they they always want to make it take take all the spirituality out of it and make oh it's just yeah. because of such, and such and so and so oh and this happened because of this and i said well yeah but it, it didn't it fulfill the prophecy that we're talking about exactly just, it's, it's so much of that secularism that people uh don't want to believe the supernaturalness of the bible and it's really sad it is it's that skepticism that spirit of skepticism that's out there you know it's like yeah right sure you can make it say anything you want it to say yeah but that's you know that's that's the typical stand they take you're right donna yeah okay so let's look at number 11 and we'll wrap up with this one tonight and uh remember another thing that jesus said on the cross into your hands i commit my spirit and he did this just before he died, right? And then he breathed his last, I think is the way the scriptures put it. It says, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And that's the part of the psalm that we're talking about here. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. And that's Psalm 31, 5. And Jesus said that too. What was the other thing he said just before that, that I think is so important to understand, especially in light of Donna's, you know, indication that Jesus died voluntarily. What did he say? What's that? It is finished. It it is finished as one. What did you say, Donna? Um, Where he asked John to take care of Mary's. Okay. Okay. Even in his death, he was, you know, it was, it was up to the oldest son to take care of the widowed, right. according to the whatever um, uh, historical things. Joseph was a, quite a bit older than Mary, and he died. You yeah. know, he was already passed away when Jesus died, and yeah. Mary was a widow. And he looked at John. He said, "Behold, your mother." He he he'd made um, uh, appropriations for his mother even in his death. Amazing, that, huh? That's love, right? It's love and know, responsibility but... yeah and, yeah. and what else did, okay so we have what sherry said what donna said what else did jesus say on the cross that was really central what did he Anyone ask the father to do oh, in my hands i commend oh. my spirit what what, what doug gail i'm sorry i was just asking if anyone had said uh it, it is finished, finished. Yeah, and yeah. That someone had already said that. Yeah. Well, the one, yeah. Did you have something, Sherry? No, I said it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I well the one I was thinking of was spirit. Father, forgive them. Oh, for yeah. They know not what they do. Oh. I mean, you talk about something that potentially would have been the hardest thing to say. It's amazing how Jesus would think of nothing but forgiving them in spite of the situation and the whole matter that was before him. I, 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 to me, that just says, man, that is God. You know, that is love. That in spite of all this, not only could he be thinking about his mom and getting John to take care of his mom, and like what Sherry said, and I mean, but we see that he was concerned about all those people that even crucified him. Father, uh-huh. forgive them. 
or they know not what they do. They know not what they do. And, and they were basically just carrying out God's plan anyway, weren't they? Because he did it. God's the one that was responsible for making it happen. Right. And I, I, I think that's beautiful. So into your hands, I commit my spirit in Psalm 31, 5. And that's look what, why he said that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because, because they didn't know they it says i think it's in corinthians that if they would have known what they were doing when they crucified the they son would have of God, never done it they never yep. would have done it yep. so he's saying forgive them because they don't know what they're doing exactly they, they really thought they were oh we're just gonna crucify him and get rid of him and he'll be gone never to be seen again and he was saying forgive them because they really <laughs> didn't know what they were doing that exactly they were, they were actually fulfilling god's plan and they you know so he was saying to forgive them because they were part of the plan that's it god's plan do not hold that sin against them you know amen. and that's what Stephen said when he was being stoned don't hold this sin against them yeah so, amen it's pretty that's pretty that takes a lot of guts to be having them, having them murder you <laughs> <laughs> i mean like Stephen, think about it I yeah mean, he, he said the same it. thing yeah yeah he did and i can't imagine um that there's going to be a time, I think, in the not too distant future where we might be having to do the same thing. And um, that's an example of what I believe God will do for us if we have to um, stand up for our faith, yeah. you know, right. that he will say, OK, you know, it's going to I don't think he felt anything physically. I think he was in the spirit so much that he just he said, I see Jesus standing at the hand of the father, you know. Right. I mean, that's all he claimed about. And so we have to just realize that that's probably what he's going to do for us when we stand up for Christ. And there's not going to be, it's not going to be long before we're going to have to start doing that. So, yeah, that's, it's coming. The time's coming. coming. Yep. So look at, look at the fulfillment is exactly what the Psalm was talking about. It says Jesus called out with a loud voice, father into your hands, I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. And at that point, that's where he gave up the ghost, right? And he fulfilled the father's plan right then and there. He died as the sacrifice. He shed his blood as a sacrifice for the whole world and for all sin. He paid the redemption price that Job talked about when he says, I know my redeemer lives. He became our redemption. Praise God for that. Boy, I'll tell you. If it wasn't for him, we'd be in deep weeds, wouldn't we? Yeah. yeah, sure. Go ahead there, Julie. You say that his spirit went, so that means his body stayed in earth? Yeah, yeah, his body stayed. Uh -huh. But well, like everybody else or, you know, like... No, no. Well, you have to feet? remember, Jesus' body was resurrected as the new body. In other words, all of us, we're going to die right? Unless Jesus comes back first, right? We're going to die. We're either going to be cremated. We're going to be put in the grave, something, right? But what's going to happen to our bodies is it stays here. And that's what you're talking about, Julie. Our bodies are going to stay here. Our spirit gets to go be with the Lord immediately, right? Absent from the body, present with the Lord is what the Bible says. But uh. what happened with Jesus's body is that when it went into the grave, Mm -hmm. On the third day, he that body was transformed into the new body and arose. That's why they found no body in the grave. It's because Jesus's body was transformed into that new body. And that's what's going to happen to all of our bodies, even if they've been burned up, eaten by a shark or, uh, you know, whatever, or it's in a grave, it, they will also resurrect and they will be the new body, just like Jesus has when he resurrected. Does that answer your question, Julie? Yes. Okay. So that's what we're looking forward to is that new body. Because even if we die today, let's say, God forbid, but if we did and we went to go be with him, this body is going to stay here. It's not going at this point in time. It won't go until it's resurrected at God's second coming. When it's resurrected, then, then this body will be united with us and we'll have our new body. I don't want my old bones. <laughs> you won't. 
I, I don't know what it'll be, but I can guarantee you that whatever God gives us at that point, you're going to be quite content with it there, <laughs> yeah, Doug. But, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Julie. But I, was, I was told that our names will be changed when you go to heaven. Why God, Jesus' name won't change? Okay, no, our names Maybe. won't be changed. We'll get a new name. But it doesn't say our names will be changed. In other words, we'll receive a new name. We'll have another name. Okay. That's um, so, yeah, I mean, I'll still know you as Julie, but you'll have a new name. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it's written on a stone that only you will know. In other words, you and God, it's, it's like this interaction, you and God with this special name. Oh, but we will have everybody's going to know you as a your name, but yeah. only Jesus is going to give you like a nickname, a, a new name, nickname. I don't know. It's written on a stone, it says, and it, that's between you and him. Yes. Oh. But it, everybody could call you by your name and the only one could call you by that name is Jesus. I, I, I that's that's my understanding. OK. So, I mean, it'll be a personal thing, you know, and I think it's, it's very personal between you and the Lord Jesus. Uh huh. About that, I heard some other people say, oh, some people's going to get like um, some extra gift. Other people going to get extra like points or something. What do you <laughs> mean with that? No, what they're talking about is when we go before the judgment seat of Christ, when believers go before his judgment seat, it's called the Bema seat. Um, we'll be judged for those things we did in the flesh, okay? We're not being judged for sin, okay? Because our sin is forgiven. Romans 8, 1 says there's now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But we will be judged based on what we did in this body, whether for good or for bad, it says. And what he's talking about is that we all have had a job to do, so to speak. When we came into the Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2.10 says that God pre prepared works for all of us to do even before time. Now, the question becomes, well, what did we do while we were serving the Lord in this body? Were we obedient? Did we do everything? Did we answer God's call when he called? Did we uh, you know, what did we do? Did we disobey him? Did we just decide, hey, I'm going to stay home and watch TV and I'm not going to go out and do what you're telling me to do? Well, when we stand before the judgment seat, what he does is he looks at what we've done. And what we what he does is he determines if we get gifts or no gifts. In other words, we get rewards based on what we've done to further his kingdom and to do those good works that he wanted us to do. For the ones that we were effective, we did right, we obeyed and we carried out, we'll get rewards. And for those that maybe he wanted us to do, but we guys kind of, nah, I want to watch uh, uh, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston instead, um, and didn't go out and do it, then you, you may lose a reward because the Bible's clear. You, you won't lose your position in heaven because of this. You're, you're still in heaven. You're with the Lord. You're his. But these rewards are what we gain based on how obedient we were, what we did while we were in him. Now, the, the way it's put in the Bible, it says that basically these works will look like either wood, hay, or stubble, or precious stones and precious metals like gold, silver, and precious stones. So it's like when you throw those into the fire, the wood, hay, and stubble will burn up. In other words, those are those things we were supposed to do maybe and we didn't do. And then the other things that we were supposed to do and we did do, those are like the precious stones. And when those come out of the fire, they are purer. And those will be our rewards. And typically, those are the kind of rewards. We may even get crowns as part of those rewards. But what, will you, what you'll find that we'll do, the Bible says we will cast our crowns at his feet. In other words, out of these rewards, we, we're not going to want them like as if, hey, I need this. I want all these gifts. You want them because you want to be able to give them to the Lord Jesus Christ, throw them at his feet because of what he did for you. Yeah, Doug. Oh, so does that answer your question, Julie? 
Yeah, but that what well, that mean what happened if the person doesn't have reward? I mean, even they're still in heaven, but they yep, yep. you can't the Bible is clear that you will, yeah, you will not be thrown out of heaven even if you don't end up getting one reward at that at the judgment seat. So what is the meaning of the rewards? That's what I was saying. The rewards are God's way of patting you on the back and saying, thank you for a job well done, good and faithful servant. That's that's what that fits into. It's about. And, and if they don't get a reward, they will get like pushed in a different, treated no, different. No, or? you're not treated any differently. You just won't have a reward. That's all. Oh. I mean, because, hey, once you're in heaven, you're in heaven. You can't be thrown out of heaven. Mm -hmm. You're his child. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Donna. I unmute myself. Oh, okay. um, what I believe is the rewards are going to be when we, when he sets up his millennial kingdom, that the, um, the position that we have in rulership and leadership during the millennial kingdom is in direct proportion to our, what we did here on earth and I kind of say it, we're in training for reigning down here so what what we did here that you know like witnessing and any kind of things that we did or what what we did in good motives our motives will be tested in that wet, wet hand stubble as well but I believe that it's direct um, correlation between the positions that we're going to head up in leadership here on the earth over the natural men while we in our glorified bodies are ruling and reigning with Jesus. Yeah, I, I have no doubt that based on our accomplishments for him here, we'll also transfer in terms of what he'll use us to do in heaven as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're faithful down here. Yeah. And then, you know, we're showing our faithfulness to obey him while we're down here, trust and obey, if there's no other way that we're doing here. We're going to... Um, it's going to be direct, like when you're at a job and you get promoted, you know, you get promoted for, you know, the doing the right thing, stuff like that. But you know, it's not going to be a seniority system or anything like that. It's strictly going to be a merit system for what we've done. Because, you know, Jesus talks about the parable of the talents and faithful in little things, faithful in great things. Those are the things that he's talking about, the kingdom of heaven, that when he sets up his millennial kingdom, what we did here is going to be a reflection of what kind of leadership we're going to have then. Not because we're going to say I'm better than you or anything right, like that, right. but it's just the faithfulness is yeah. just going to follow straight through to the, to that leadership. Yeah. Up there, it has nothing to do with pride. Okay. It's not like you're going to get up there and say, Hey, look, I'm better than Sherry because man, look, I got four bars of gold and Sherry only got three, you know, it, no, it's not that at all up in heaven. We're not, we're going to have already shed all the that evil emotion and evil that we had in this fallen body. That's all going that to be competition. gone. There won't be the competition. That's right. And it's not no. going to be like that during the millennial reign either when right. we're ruling. It's just strictly going to be our position that we're going to hold. And it's not going to be like I'm going to lord it over somebody else or somebody else right. is going to lord it over me. Right. But it's just it's just a simple. Uh, this is the position that you get because this is what you did. Yep. faithfully on on the earth when you know you could have done something different you know like right. when you ha every time we've had to choose between good and evil there that that's a, a stored up as our reward in heaven when we choose the right thing right path instead of the wrong path right. you know and it's just it's it's not a case of of um uh how whether we're going to be in heaven or not everybody's going to be in heaven if they're born again but it's a case of the rewards for the position we're going to hold when we're here ruling and reigning with Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. and some will have, some will have bigger kingdoms than others, you know, larger uh, capacity and King David's going to be the one that's supposed to be sitting on the throne. That's right. we're all, we'll all receive our orders from um, him or somebody directly under him. And how like you said, works. there's no like human emotions out uh, there. Not negative. Mm -hmm. no. Uh, when we I have think, to work with bodies, we're not going to have pride and we're not going to have all that jealousy, jealousy. pride and envy and yeah, all that none stuff. Of that. We're gonna, none of we're going to be delivered of that, you know, yeah. but, the, but the people here on earth, the humans that are here on earth are still going to be struggling with that. And we're yeah. going to be ruling and reigning over, over them during that time. Yeah. Like the devil won't be here to tempt them so much. So they won't, 
you know, they're, they're still going to have a, a heart that, you know, may sin, but it's not going to be as easy to, you know, it's not going to be as hard to not sin when Jesus is ruling and reigning, you know, but that's the whole, the whole purpose of that last uh, uh, millennial kingdom is to show that the heart of man is still decept deceptfully w wicked among all things, you know, yeah. Even when there's no devil to tempt them, they're still going to be tempted. You know, so that's the fallen nature. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. But we won't so, have that because we'll have a no. glorified body. Exactly. Exactly. And About uh, are we going to have jobs? Are we going to be sleeping? Uh, able to sleep? Are we going to have day, night, a house? In, in our new bodies, I I don't think we will not need sleep. Um, it it's that's a human condition. Okay, and our new bodies are going to be spiritual bodies as well. But in Christ, hey, God neither slumbers nor sleeps. We're going to be with him in his kingdom. It's always light there. Okay, it's not like you have darkness. It's always light. And you get to live with him forever and ever. No, we in our new bodies, no, we don't sleep. We don't have, our bodies don't run down. They don't work off of metabolism the same way that our earthly bodies work off of. Okay, and so, no. It says in Revelation that there will be no day or night because Jesus will That's be right. the light. You know, so right. it, we're not going to have day, night, any of that stuff. It's just going to be like amazing. I yep. can't wait. And Jesus said that He was going to a way to prepare a place for us that where He is, there we may be also. And He said that He was going to play. In some translations, it says He goes and prepares like a, a castle or. A, you know, a mansion. a mansion for us, whereas the l later translations say basically a building. <laughs> or a room. Some of them just say yeah. a room. In my yeah. father's house are, are many mansions, many rooms, rooms many places. Rooms, yeah. whatever, but whatever it is, we're going to be happy with it. We're not oh, yeah, be... absolutely. What's that, Doug? What you say? Oh, a pup tent. Oh, a pup tent. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy with a concrete jungle and a pup tent as long as I don't have to bring every thought captive to the obedience of yeah. Christ anymore. <laughs> well, just remember, you know, we're not going to have any desire to want to have, like, you know, these things that are prideful that we need it fixed up a certain way. We're going to be happy with it just as it is. No. We're no not gonna, iPad. <laughs> yeah, no iPad. Forget the You're iPad. Not gonna need one. But, You're not going to need one. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, what he says is that, you know, we can't even begin to imagine the things that God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, whatever he gives us up there, it's going to be beyond our current imagination. And we're going to be, man, we're going to be blown away with it. That's it's as simple as that. I mean, we think we would only be happy a certain way here on earth. That's human thinking. When we have his mind up there, it, we're going to be blown away. It's going to be like, wow, God, you are awesome and amazing. Are, are we going to have Bibles or he's going to be our instructor? Well, he will be um, he will be our priest. He's a prophet, priest and king. He will continue to be our priest. Uh, the Bible is always the word of God is forever and ever. OK, but uh, we will all. Everything that we do up there will be learning more about God, and that's what it's going to be like for all eternity. I mean, we will never exhaust the wonders of who God is, and we'll be learning more about him and thanking Christ all along and carrying out God's work for all eternity while we're with him. And I mean, some would say, well, that sounds boring, man. Won't I get tired? No, I guarantee you that every single item will be new it's not going to be a rehash it's it's going to be something bigger and better as i don't even want to say time goes on because eternity isn't about time eternity is just an ongoing forever and ever and it will just get better and better and better i like c.s lewis's books that talk about that end time thing because he just says it's like going up and seeing more and just being yeah it it guaranteed um, we can't even begin to know and see or even contemplate the wonder that God has prepared for us. It's going to be great. You just can't think about it in a human no, thought process no. because it's completely different. Exactly. I mean, like Julie's mentioning, none of that stuff exists in the spiritual world because it's it's a whole different situation. I mean, we're not human anymore, so it's like we don't even need to eat yeah, and right. from 
but I, I heard you can if you want. Just that's right. Because you're that's familiar, right. but you don't have to to sustain life. Right. Is there right. is eternal life? Exactly. I believe but, there's um, a there's a mountain but, of ice cream in heaven, and everyone gets a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't gain weight either. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, and you won't care. Part. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but I mean, the beauty of it is there will be the Feast of the Lamb. I mean, so it, there indicates that there will be, you know, us mm -hmm. being able to sit down and just have a great meal together, just almost like, you know, Hebrews 20, I mean, Revelation 20, um, 320 says, you know, uh, here I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I will come in and sup with you and you with me. In other words, there's relationship. There's yeah. So what's that, Doug? Oh, I'm just murdering. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Another question about. Oh, go ahead. Sherry, there's not going to be any supermodels or Barbie dolls for us to compare nope. ourselves to. <laughs> yeah, right? No. Nope. Oh. Nope. <laughs> you know yeah. what I heard? And I don't know if it's just like a rumor, but I heard that, you know, when you get to heaven, that you can be any age of your life that you lived already. Like, if I want to look like I did when I was 20, I can be that that picture of that person at 20 years old. You don't go up there, whatever you look like when you die, and that's what you have to look like in heaven. That's what I heard. I don't know if it's true or not, but. I get, well, so. let me put it this way, Sherry. We're not gonna care at, at that point, you know, what we look like, but I could put it this way. We're going to be content with whatever God has us look like, whatever he has us be, whatever he has us do. We're gonna just be, thankful to be there with him because jesus paid the price and that's why we're there with him is because he paid the price okay one more question about rewards um now i've heard this from lots of people i don't know if it's biblical or not because i don't remember seeing it but i heard that you know if you suffer greatly on earth you'll get more rewards in heaven well, it depends what you're talking about suffering about if you're just like suffering because you're sick or something like that yeah. It depends. If that pain came from serving the Lord, yes. Uh, it, it's, it's about, see, everything that's going to be judged by rewards has to do with what you did in this body for him. If you suffered because of doing something for him, then yes, that suffering will, I guarantee you, it will be addressed at, at the Bema seat. But if you're just sick because, well, you took drugs and you messed up your body and it just doesn't want to come out. Uh, no, even though you're a Christian, uh, no, that's not going to come out as a reward. It's got to be something you like, did for serving the Lord. No, I'm talking about like, you know, I was in a bad car accident and I became disabled. I'm in pain every single day. Um, that wasn't serving the Lord. I was heading to church at the time when it happened, yeah. but, um, maybe, maybe that, that then yeah. I'm not, I'm, and, you know, I'm not sitting the judgment is, seat, but may, I know, maybe, but who knows? maybe, maybe Jesus may give you credit for that and say, Hey, you were headed to church and you know, your heart was in the right place. Uh, you know, you were coming. I don't know. Hey, I guarantee you that you will not be disappointed with whatever God does in, through, and for you when you get up into heaven. I guarantee you. You're not going to be saying, oh, come on, God, man, shoot, look at what I went through. Are you sure you're not going to, you know, give me a little extra bonus on that on that reward? Look, look what I had to do, man. I was in pain. No, I, I guarantee you that whatever God had, gives you, you will know it is as fair as fair can be because it's coming from God who is just. And we won't question it. We'll say, thank you, Lord, for whatever he gives us. I guarantee you. It's not going to be like, are you sure, Lord? You know, type of thing. Yeah. I think like in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, that angel that came down and was trying to do th good things on, on the earth to earn his wings. Remember that? <laughs> trying to hit his wings that's a reward right. up there in heaven <laughs> oh we're gonna have wings <laughs> uh, no uh, chicken wings i don't know uh <laughs> <laughs> getting back to the broken legs that's in john 19 31 through 34 yeah that's where it, it talks about that yeah i know okay uh, by the way thank you victor where was that where was that passage in numbers that says 
None of the bones will be broken. Well, it's in numbers, it's talking about the Passover lamb. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, hang on. That's your homework, Margaret. Here. I heard it, but I didn't write it down. Just I think say. it might have been 9, 12. Just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. That's what I wrote down. Look it up on Google, Mark. Uh, numbers 9, 12. 9, 12. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Well, that's our lesson for tonight, folks. It's amazing where some of these prophecies will take us, isn't it? Yeah. You know, in the process, we start, it opens up our minds to some of the wonders that God has prepared for those who love him. And I mean, it's, it's amazing that we're contemplating, what is it that God has for me? What is he going to show me? What's he going to give me? How, you know, how's it going to be? Because I tell you, that's where we're going. That's what we want to know. We want to know, you know, what does God have for me? And what does he have in store for me? And I'll tell you, it's, they are, they're great questions, but I can guarantee you that, hey, no matter what, when we get there, we are going to be awed and amazed, and we're going to experience a love that surpasses understanding, and we're going to be like, I didn't know you had all this for me, and I was worried that I might not get credit for some things, and man, but look at what you've given me, Lord, and, and we're just going to fall at his feet, and we're going to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I heard it's endless worship when you get to heaven. You don't just like float around on a cloud all day. You <laughs> worship Jesus constantly while you're there. And, and you're not going to get tired of it. It's going to be like, man, I don't deserve being here, but thank you, Jesus. Because, man, what's that, Victor? Just like a little kid on Christmas morning wondering what's inside the package. <laughs> From a human perspective, right? Yeah, that's about as close as we can get. Yeah, but it's it's in there. It's in there and it's going to be wonderful. So praise God. Okay, well, that does it for today's lesson. Um, we'll pick up at number, what number were we on? Oh, well, I closed it out. 12. 12, was 12 it? Okay. 12. We'll pick up on number 12 next week. And, uh, and we'll keep looking at some of those and see where you know, those prophecies take us in our discussions and everything. I, I guarantee you, I mean, when you see well, that God is in control, you start realizing nothing's impossible for God. And that, man, we have some wonderful times to look forward to ahead of us in spite of what we have to endure now. It's, it's temporal, but with him, it will be inter eternal. That's awesome. Let's just hope we don't get banned. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> we'll be next, you know. <laughs> oh my goodness. <sighs> no exemptions. Okay. What prayer request do we have, folks? I have a prayer request. Okay, go my ahead, Julie. Granddaughter Isabella is going went today to the mom after for the first time that she's gonna see her new brother, um, the baby. So I just want to make sure, you know, that God um Keep protect Isabella because the mother is not that that loving care. Like she thinks that the two year old is, is an adult that had to do everything for her. So that's the only thing I'm mm -hmm. concerned. And as well for my daughter, that she's and my son, both of them are in school in, and there being a lot of stress in them. Okay. That's your your daughter and your son, right? Elisa and Vangelier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got it. Anybody else? Um, please pray for Howard again because um, I haven't heard from him in a couple of days and I keep trying to call and text him and he's not responding to anything. And, you know, it's hard when you're in a relationship with someone and you don't you don't know if something's wrong with them because the family's not going to call and say, Hey, something happened or whatever. So 
it's really rough. He has a lot of medical issues and, you know, so I worry about him if he hasn't responded to me. Right. So just pray that he's okay. Um, the last time I talked to him, which was a few days ago, um, he said he was doing good, but he was still having some tests done because he's having problems. Okay. So, so yeah. You got it. You got it. Anybody else? Okay. Well, we'll pray for our nation and, and the coming, you know, turning over of the presidency on the 20th that Lord willing, it'll be peaceful, you know, because right now it sounds like it doesn't look that way. Right. Right. Sherry. Yeah. So, okay. Well then let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the honor and the opportunity of studying your word. We, man, we are just so amazed to see how you've always had everything under control, Heavenly Father. And that even so, you've provided us insight to show us that you have been sovereign since before creation. And that even through all of creation, you've shown that you know and orchestrate what it is that is going to happen. You are awesome, Lord. And because of that, we know we can trust you because you've had it happen before. And you know, we know that what is to come, that you've, you've prophesied in your word, will actually come to pass. So we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we are in your family and that we have such wonder to look forward to in your kingdom. And so we give you honor and glory, Lord, and we praise you. And we just look forward to a time when we are going to be with you forever. Let us be obedient and trusting in you in all that we do. So that, you know, when we get to heaven, we will not be ashamed, but we will get there with, with you know, just an open desire to want to please you, to honor you, to worship you and all that we do. And know that, you know, we can look forward to a time when you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, Lord, I want to bring up, you know, Julie's prayer request for Isabelita. And, and now that she's going back to her mother and she's going to meet her new sibling, Lord, I pray for peace in the family. I pray for Isabelita's mom, that, Lord, you would change her heart. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would draw her and bring her into saving grace. Lord, only you can do that kind of work. But I ask you just to change her heart so that she can see that the only true peace in this world can only be found in you. Not any other way, but only in you. Because it'd be great to have both parents from Isabelita to know you, Lord Jesus, and to bring up both of those children in, in your way. I also uh, want to pray for... Uh, Elisa and Van Julier, Lord, you know the difficulties and the stress they're going through. I pray, Lord, that you would just manifest yourself in a peaceful way to them and let them know that peace that surpasses understanding that you talk about in Philippians 4, 7, that they would know that you're near and that you're always available to look out for them and to be with them. All they have to do is just seek you. And so I pray that they would just open up their hearts and minds to you and, and know that you're there and cast all their cares on you. So we ask for you to give them peace as they deal with these uncertain times and these difficulties of life that we're all going through right now, Lord, I pray. I also want to bring up Sherry's request as we pray for Howard. You know his situation, Lord. We ask that you just put your hand on him we, I'm sure he's going through some difficult issues and times, and maybe in some cases he probably just wants to have some alone time. I don't know. But you know what's going on. I pray that you would just give Sherry peace as uh, these, these issues are dealt with, and that there would just be a communication between you know ha uh, Howard and Sherry that at least would give assurance that everything's okay on both sides. And so, Lord, we seek that you just put your hand on Howard. If he's dealing with anything that's problematic, I pray that you would just, you know, help resolve it. 
and let him know that you're near, Lord, and that you love him and care for him in every situation. Now, Lord, I also want to pray for this nation. Oh, man, I, I, I don't even know where to start. But I'll just put it in this way, Lord. Uh, this nation is in trouble. We need you, Lord. And these people need yeah. to come back to you. So, Lord, I pray that we would just seek you, um, that we would realize that the only solution to anything in this world, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's political, whether it's, uh, you know, mob uh, mentality, the only solution in and through it all is you, Lord. Help us to seek you and look to you and not antagonistically go against our government, but to pray for our government, because that's what you've asked us to do. And that we would live out a life that is pleasing to you and reflects you in all that we do. Also, Lord, I pray that the transition of presidency would go smoothly and that you would address with these people that are being antagonistic to, to calm down, Lord, that they, they don't need to try to start up another furor of some kind of, you know, what's going on like they did with the uh, Congress and the Capitol building. So, Lord, I just pray that you would change hearts and minds and that you would give your peace and direction to those that are in office and those coming into office, that you would provide wisdom in the best thing to carry out. Because, Lord, you're still sovereign, Lord. You still control everything, even those that sit on the president's seat or any of those that are in Congress or Senate or any other leadership position, whether in the justice system. It all comes from you. So we look to you, Lord, and we ask for your direct intervention and guidance and that we would have a peaceful transition and that this nation would have a desire to come to you, Lord, because only solutions that, will, that are effective are through you. Now, Lord, as we go, I pray that you go with us. For those that are going to church, the church building in the morning, I pray you keep them safe. For those that are watching online, I just pray that the message and the services that are provided will build us up and bring us closer to you and that we would model you in our actions and our deeds in a way that honors and glorifies you. We praise you and we thank you and we just honor you through the opportunity to be able to study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, everybody. God bless you all. Enjoy take. the cold tonight. Uh. <laughs> hey, Jen, are, you, are you preparing these outlines of the prophecies, or are you? I, I you no. I've I, on the last page of the handout. I put the website that it's at. Okay. Thank, well, if you were doing that, I was going to thank you a lot because that looks like it took quite a bit of work to put that. Yeah. Together. No. I, I I wish I could take credit for it, but. I mean, it would, if I was to do it myself, yes, it would take a lot of work, but man, there would be, you know, we, we would probably have hundreds. And so they had, they had a much more manageable load and I, it makes the point, you know, in terms of God's control through prophecy and whatnot. So that's why I was using something that was already done. Yeah. God bless everybody. Thank you, Ted. Good night, Julie. Good night, Yvonne. God bless you. Bye. Good night. See y'all. Thanks, Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Yeah. Good night, Doug. Good night, Gail. Good yeah. night, Aaron. Bye. Um, good night, Vic. Good night, Vic. Good yeah, night, Vic Ted. already took yeah, off, Margaret. <laughs> That's all right. Good night, Ted. Good night, Margaret. Wednesday. Wednesday it is, my sister. Genesis. You got it. God bless you. Have a good night. From Genesis 11. Yeah. Genesis 11. Yes, ma'am. And we'll pick up in it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>